I'll, I'll share a little story with you, though, and this is interesting, okay? I just told you about my son, and he was six then, he's 17 now, okay? And he grew up in the Peru School District, okay? Well, about a year ago, both of my kids, my son at, 17, at 16, my daughter at 13, they moved with their mom to Brooklyn. I had them for a year, and our arrangement was that she get her, her, her life organized enough to receive the kids without that undue pressure. So then when she got that, I had to give my kids up, and they're living in Brooklyn. Okay, so here's the interesting thing about that. The kids used to come home at least two or three times a week. And they'd come home, and they would tell me stories about hearing the word nigger. So I got more nigger stories than you have family stories probably. Okay, I constantly heard that. And the kids were tired of it, but their mom and I worked on their perspectives, and they became stronger with it, and were able to put it in a context. But it, it came out in some odd ways. One of the best kids on their soccer team, when he would have an awkward moment on the field, he would drop, he would lace tirade that would have a lot of profanity that when we stub our toe or, or do something we shouldn't do that we would drop, you know, damn, shit, excuse all the profanity, but dysfunctional language is my thing, so I'm going there. Damn, shit, maybe even fuck, right? He'd have that. And then after those three, he'd say nigger. Well, how does that become one of the things that allows you to, you know, get the stress off you? But he would say it. So my kids had all these moments, and uh, feeling pretty oppressed by it. So diversity in the North Country. Hmm. My kids go to Brooklyn, and when they go to Brooklyn, they become white kids. My kids moved to Brooklyn and became white kids because of how they talk, how they sound. And they were ridiculed constantly about it. So they were the black kids, the coolest kids, are considered some of the coolest kids in Peru, and then they became very uncool when they moved to Brooklyn because they were trying not to use dysfunctional language like their dad and, and mom have endorsed. Okay, they were trying to do a whole lot of things to transition in. And you know, my, my kids came back and told me that they hear the word nigger easily over a hundred times a week, both of them in two different schools. Okay, stand in front of teachers, constantly laid out all over the place. Also, as the new kids, my daughter, who is very into popularity, she went into the school, not listening to us about going understated, going kind of chill, you know, transition in. None of that. Okay, she went in, I'm here. Hook me up. Okay, so my daughter and son on different levels were under siege. Okay, my son a little more chill, so not necessarily the physical piece, but my daughter got jumped on by four girls. And fortunately, she had developed enough capital where she had some other people uh, who helped in that moment get her off there. But with that situation and the stuff that my son was going through, I, I, I approached my kids and said, you can come back. You don't have to live in Brooklyn. Come back and live with Dad. Do you know that the threat of violence was more attractive to my kids than them being the only black kids in their classes in Peru? That's mind-blowing. I could not believe when my kids told me that. So the, so, so the scars that visit us are so deep and so powerful that yes, nigger for me is probably the most difficult term that I've had to be concerned with relative to my kids. But relative to my reality as an educator, as somebody who's done all the work I've done in the North Country, it's not. I don't want any kid that's in the mix with me or any kid that's going through the educational process to be distracted by language that shouldn't be used. And so it brings me back to the question, are you doing enough? Leaders, are you doing enough? Because there's so much for us to do.